Unwritten. Unwritten is the word of the day for nothing personal. And I'm worked up. The way this show works, you've been listening to nothing personal. If this is your first time listening to nothing personal. We have a word of the day. It's called unwritten. There's a producer named Matthew Coca. He produces the show. We've been working together. This is episode 199, plus some of the Samson sit downs and bonus pods. We talk about the show the night before. We talk about it the morning of. We, we winnow down the topics we're going to discuss. Coca decides what order he wants to discuss them in. We then go through each topic, have conversations. We agree once in a while. We disagree once in a while. But this morning was a little different. It was a full-fledged argument because I have a hard time communicating in an unwritten way with people like Coca who are so set in their ways that the man is trying to hold them down so badly that the ears close, the brain shuts down, and there's an automatic knee-jerk reaction to anything that a person of authority says. Ironically, I'm not the person of authority on this show. We are partners. One of the great parts of yesterday's show is when I acknowledge that when things go well, it's because of Coca and David. When things don't go well, it's just because of David. But Coca's, I don't know, 29, 30 years old. I don't know what generation he is. I don't even understand. He may be generation QXR or LPJ or LBJ or millennial. I don't know what he is. I don't know what I am. I just know that I'm not understanding. People are going crazy. Unwritten. What am I talking about? What's unwritten? The unwritten rules of baseball are the talk of the town today. So we're going to talk about it because I've had just about enough. Fernando Tatis Jr., the son of Fernando Tatis Sr., who's famous for hitting two grand slams in the same inning, a record that will never be broken. Forget the number of wins Cy Young had. Forget the number of games that Cal Ripken Jr. played in a row. Nobody will ever hit three grand slams in one inning ever, ever. It's not a wait to see. Just book it. So Fernando Tatis Jr. plays for the San Diego Padres. He's young, he's brash, he's talented, he's fun. He plays for a team that's trying to be relevant. They signed Manny Machado to $300 million. They have a decent pitching staff. They have Eric Hosmer, who's overpaid. They're fighting for a playoff spot. Fernando Tatis is having a great season, leading the league in home runs. I think he's tied with Mike Trout. And Aaron Judge, maybe he's one ahead of all of them now. Trying to bring baseball into the 21st century because all we hear, and I'm tired of it, baseball's for old people. Baseball's boring. Baseball needs to change. I did a whole show with Jason Stark where we agreed that baseball needs to stop and let the kids play. Baseball needs to be fun needs to let players express themselves, needs to develop personalities, needs to allow personalities to shine through. All the unwritten rules, and there are many of them. The one that got violated last night is the following rule. When you have a substantial lead of five runs or more in the eighth inning or later, and the bases are loaded, or there's two men on, or there's one man on, when you have a three ball and zero strike count, the unwritten rule says you take a strike. In yesterday's game, the Padres were playing the Rangers. The Padres, first year manager, his name is Jace Tingler, second year manager of the Rangers, and we're going to get to what he said about this in a minute is a man named Chris Woodward, who, by the way, I could be wrong, and it wouldn't be the first time. I believe he may have worked on the bench for the Padres before becoming the manager's coach. Could he have been Bochy's, one of Bochy's coaches, Coca? I have that weird feeling. I don't know why. So the Padres are beating the Rangers 10-3. to Tatis is up with the bases loaded, 3-0 count. He swings. He hits a grand slam. The score is 14 to three. 
Manny Machado comes to the plate. Manny Machado gets thrown at. Nobody gets ejected. So Chris Woodward was the third base coach for the Dodgers. So he had nothing to do with the Padres. Thank you, Coca. Manny Machado gets thrown behind as a clear message from the Rangers that they were less than happy that Fernando Tatis had swung on a 3-0 pitch. So let me break down a couple of thoughts. Number one, it is the manager's job, period, hard stop. It is the manager's job to give signs to players playing the game. The same as it is the coach's job in basketball to call plays. The same as it is football coordinator's job to call offensive and defensive plays. Don't give me the argument, Coca, that Peyton Manning audibles, and so players have to have the right to audible. Of course, football players have the right to audible. That's because when they line up under scrimmage and they see that there's a different defense than what the coach thought, they then have a list of plays to deal with that new defense. The quarterback recognizes the defense, calls an Omaha audible, and the game continues, which is quite different than an NBA player where a play is called by a coach, not on a fast break transition, but out of a timeout when a play is called, it is out of line for a player to decide, you know what? I don't like that play. I'm going to run a different play. That's not how it works. The coach gets to call the play and the players have to execute it. In baseball, there are signs that come from the dugout and from the third base coach every game, all game. Remember we talked about it? You touch your nose, you touch your ears, you touch your chin, nose, ears, chin, nose. That's whether or not the pitcher is throwing to first base when there's a man on first. There's an indicator. It's the first sign after the ear. You go nose, chin, nose, chin, ear, nose, nose. That's throw over. Have you ever seen the catcher with a man on base looking into the dugout? Do you think he's looking for approval from his dad? He's looking for a sign. And when the sign comes, that's what the players do. Then you've got the third base coach, hand on the chest, Go hand going down the left arm, hand going down the right arm, taking the cap off, wiping his hair, wiping his brow, covering his chest, touching his nose, touching his knees. Third base coach, two hands on the knees. Third base coach standing five feet to the left of the coach's box. All of those are different signs indicating to both runners and hitters what's next. Are you bunting? Are you stealing? Is it a hit and run? Is it a squeeze? Is it a safety squeeze? If you've ever seen a third base coach go talk to a hitter, that's because the hitter doesn't remember what the indicator is or what the sign is. If you've ever seen a catcher go to the mound, it's because the pitcher forgot what the indicator was from the catcher's signs. By the way, when a catcher gives a sign to a pitcher to throw a pitch, it's the job of the pitcher to throw it. If the pitcher doesn't like it, he shakes his head and gets another sign. And they keep going until they find a pitch that the pitcher wants to throw that the catcher gives the sign that the pitcher wants. When they can't get it together, it's called the mound visit. Have you ever seen a catcher getting crossed up? That's when a pitcher doesn't know what to throw and the catcher gets something wrong. So Coca, in his passionate, however misguided way, would like me to address why the pitcher shakes off the pitch if it came from the dugout. So obviously I'm not being clear, so let me be more clear. Catchers call the games for the most part. There are some catchers whose game is called by the dugout, and those catchers look to the dugout, get the sign, give it to the pitcher. When the pitcher doesn't like the sign, the catcher goes back to the dugout, the manager gives a different pitch, and then the catcher gives that pitch to the pitcher. But 99% of the catchers catch their own games, call their own pitches, and the pitcher shakes it off when they have an idea of what they want to throw. And if the catcher and pitcher can't agree, they're going to talk about it. I always blamed pitchers when pitchers threw a pitch they didn't want to pitch and then give up a home run and blame the catcher for calling the wrong sign. And I say, no, no, you're the pitcher, you're in charge. If you don't like the sign coming from the catcher, you talk to the catcher, you do a mound visit, you shake them off until you are comfortable throwing what you want to throw. 
But when we give you a suggestion of what to throw, it's because we've got the data, the analytics, and we know that if you throw a 3-1 breaking ball to Stanton, you have a better chance of getting him out than you throwing a 3-1 98 mile an hour up and in because if you miss, he's going to get all of it. So Tatis hits the Grand Slam and everyone all over the Twitterverse is saying, unreasonable, everyone's upset because Tatis should have been allowed to swing. Why are they upset? Well, listen to what Chris Woodward, the manager of the Rangers, said after the game. There's a lot of unwritten rules that are, you know, constantly being challenged, I think, in, in today's game. So, um, yeah, I didn't like it, personally. Um, you know, when you're up by seven in the eighth inning, it's typically not a good time to swing 3-0. That's kind of, you know, the way we were all kind of raised in the game. But, you know, like I said, the, the norms are being challenged on a daily basis. So, just because I don't like it doesn't mean it's not right. But uh, I don't think we liked it as a group. I really don't care that you didn't like it, Chris, because forget the norms being changed. It's a 60-game season. It's not the World Cup where goals count, but you know what it is? It's a juiced ball era where people are hitting home runs. Pitchers have no command because their arms are falling out of their sockets. Runners are on base at all times. People are scoring runs, walk-off grand slams. The A's hit a walk-off grand slam every other day. If you have a seven-run lead, make it a 10-run lead. Make it a 12-run lead. Make it a 15-run lead. Every game counts 2.7 times. You lost 2.7 games yesterday, Chris. It didn't bother me what Chris Woodward said, old school. Norms are being challenged. You're right, norms are being challenged. Here's what shouldn't be challenged. When your manager gives you the take sign, you take. How come no one's talking about the fact that Fernando Tatis got the take sign? I don't agree with giving Tatis the take sign. In the old days, you give the take sign on 3-0 when you have a big lead. Those are the old days. Not the unwritten rules, the old days. I don't like them. Run up the score. Score as many as you can because your pitching stinks and you could just as easily give up a 10 spot. I've seen it. But Jace Tingler, after the game apologized. Fernando Tatis actually met the media and apologized, saying, I will learn from this. I should have taken the pitch. And people thought, my God, we are quashing his individualism. We're stopping him from being the face of baseball. That's not what he was talking about. He missed the sign from his own manager. When you manage a team and your players miss a sign, you cannot let that go. We can debate until the cows jump over the crescent moon whether Tingler, the manager of the Padres, should have given the take sign. But you cannot debate me that having given the take sign, that Tati should have paid attention to it. When you're the manager, you've got to manage 26 guys, now 28 guys, used to be 25 guys. And you've got to manage them in a way so that it's very clear that when you say something, that is what you expect to be done. That doesn't mean that you're running a dictatorship because the manager is working with the front office. The manager is working with the coaching staff. The manager knows his players. But there are certain strategic moments in a game where it's the manager and front office's job to make the decision, not the player's. When there's a 3-0 pitch that's right down the middle and a player doesn't swing because he had the take sign, that's how it goes. One day, someone will explain to me why on August 18th, 2020, people felt the need in this day and age to blame those like me who are changing the narrative and explaining the facts behind the scenes, which is not that the unwritten rules should be changed, which they should, which is not that the unwritten rules should be written because they should. What I am suggesting is that the dynamic between the manager and the player, the front office and the manager, the front office and the player, those are dynamics that the hierarchy needs to be followed. Unwritten, it's the word of the day. Speaking of norms, you know what I like when we bring in a uh, 
I was talking about this with Coca before the show. Someone uh, on CBS, maybe Pete Prisco, who if you don't follow Pete Prisco, you should. He is ornery and interesting and learned and fun. He said, apparently, and this is total hearsay because I didn't hear him say it. And I'm not telling you this so you can decide for yourself the truth of what he said. I am merely saying that Pete Prisco said that Joe Judge, the Giants coach, is no Bill Belichick. Well, that's true. He worked for Bill Belichick. He worked for Nick Saban. But he's now the head coach of the New York Giants. First time head coach. This is his first season as head coach. And he stepped in it last night in a way that first coaches do who think that they have won a ring as a head coach when in fact they've won rings as coordinators or players or something else. So this situation is that the Giants are at training camp. They had their first practice in pads. All of football started padded practice. Remember under the new agreement with the players, there will be 14 padded practices before game one of the NFL season, which I believe we're four weeks away from. We're going to talk later in the show about fans in the stands in the NFL and whether or not that's going to happen and whether or not that's fair if it does. But Joe Judge had a press conference after his first day in pads, and he was asked a question about why, for the first time, there were no names on the back of the practice uniforms. And this is what Joe Judge actually said. We know who they are. But you have to take them off. I mean, why, why not have jersey names on the back of the jersey? What, the jersey names? Yeah. I, ne- I never commented on jersey names when I got here anyway. To be honest with you, I've been, I've been places where we've gone entire off season without numbers. To me, it's important to know who the players are on the field across from you by their body type and how they move, more so than having to see a nameplate to identify your teammate. We should know each other as coaches and players by how we move and the way we carry ourselves. Body type? and how they move. So let me get this straight. Joe Judge is trying to channel his inner patriot or maybe his inner Yankee. And he's saying that it is the job of the coaching staff to know the players who are wearing helmets and pads because they should know their body type and their movement. He said that as a player, when you're lining up against a team, even if it's your own team or a different team, you should be able to look at who's lined up on the defensive end and look at him and say, well, is that the defensive end or is that a defensive back who's up at the line of scrimmage? Is that an inside linebacker? We're talking about practice, Joe. We're talking about preseason. We're talking about having names on jerseys for the following reasons. Why do we put names on jerseys? I'm going to tell you why we did it in baseball, because we had this exact conversation, and it's pretty funny. So the names on jerseys in baseball are so executives and coaches can actually know who the players are. And you can't tell me that football players all look different, whether you're a running back or a defensive back or a lineman. Now, granted, some are bigger than others. Just like in baseball, there are some players bigger than others. From behind, without a name, I can tell Stanton. But when it comes to spring training, when I've got 65 players on the field, I've got a piece of paper that has the uniform number and name on it. Then I match it with the numbers and names I see on the field. That doesn't mean I don't know the players well enough. It means that I don't want to take the time when I am watching the players play to take the extra minute, second, or hour to figure out, wait, was that Josh A. Smith? Smith, Was that Josh B. Smith? Wait, was that Jones or Smith? Oh, no, that's Anderson. Damn it. Joe Judge was so full of eyewash during that press conference that it just made me laugh. And the reason it made me laugh is I kept thinking to myself, When the owners of the Giants are watching that and they're evaluating Joe Judge as a coach, they could not possibly care less that Joe Judge believes that he and his coaches and players should know each other by their body types, not by their names. They don't need names. 
It is a total results-oriented business. And all of the gimmicks that new coaches do trying to emulate old successful coaches, it would be like Joe Judge wearing a hoodie and making him feel like he's more Belichick because of it. What will make Joe Judge succeed in New York is winning games. It has nothing to do with jerseys. So when asked by the media that question, you are also hurting the media, which hurts the promotion of your team because the media needs to know the names of the players doing things so they can write about it. So when asked by the media to just answer by saying that we expect our guys to know more, they shouldn't need it, I feel as though he's trying way, way, way too hard. Joe Judge, you got some work to do, but I think you can do it. I hope so, because I'm a Giants fan through and through, and uh, it would be nice. It would be nice. All right, Coca, what do we got? You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. Yes, you do. So you want to talk to Samson segment? We do. Get into Twitter at David P. Samson. Please follow me and on Instagram or Twitter and uh, get into the DMs and ask a question. I'll try to get to it. And uh, if I don't, I'll try to answer it directly on the DM. And if I don't do that, I do try to read as many as I can. But thanks to you and many of the loyal listeners at Nothing Personal, there's uh, more and more people coming in. So here's the question. I always like when a question starts with Mr. Sampson, hope you're well, because I turn around and look to see whether my father is over my shoulder or my grandfather. I'm David. You can call me David. Mr. Sampson, hope you're well. What does this really mean? He's referring, this question refers to what's going on in the NBA, where a word came out yesterday that All-Star Weekend in 2021, scheduled to be President's Weekend in Indianapolis, may have a problem because word got leaked that the hotel contracts that the NBA and the Pacers had held with local downtown hotels had been let go, where the hotels had been called and said, we don't need the rooms anymore. So the question was, I imagine they have thousands of rooms reserved and just won't need as many even if they do have All-Star Game there. Or does it for sure mean that the All-Star Game is going to be in a safer location, probably much like the entire season? Thanks for that question, and let me answer it. What it means is, first of all, I got to tell you something funny. In the old days, none of this would have happened. When we were hosting the All-Star Game in 2017, we started several years in advance working with the Greater Hotel and Convention Visitors Bureau. We started working with the Chamber of Commerces, with the politicians, figuring out where FanFest would be. We needed a, hotels, we needed space and meeting events, and it was a whole, we had over 30 committees made up of Marlins employees complemented by certain Major League Baseball employees. And those committees were in charge of different aspects of the All-Star Game. If you were at the All-Star Game in Miami in 2017, that great home run derby, uh, that great, I believe it may have been an extra inning All-Star Game. Oh my God. The All-Star Game that we hosted in Miami at Marlins Park, I'm completely blanking. Did Robinson Cano for Seattle by chance hit the game-winning home run or a, a go-ahead home run or a hit. Oh, my God, Coca. I'm having a moment. I could you just do it for me, please? How did the 2017 All-Star Game end? So anyway, and that was the home run derby where I wanted Stanton to win and Justin Bohr was in it and he did well and Aaron Judge ended up stealing the show. I think Aaron Judge won the home run derby in 17. This is the worst moment I've had on nothing personal that I would forget the 17 All-Star game in that way. It's only three years ago. In any case, so cut to, you make these hotel reservations in blocks. Coke is telling me it was Cano. Yes! Cano hit a home run to win the game, Coca? 
I can't believe it. And he was the all-star MVP. Did Judge win the Derby? I wish you could hear Coco when he talks into my ear and writes in very small print. He's going to have to separately search that while I'm talking. I'm not going to delay any further because the way it works is you go to the hotels and you get, yes, it was Judge. So I did have it. I just, I got to believe that I still have a few synapses left, which is shocking at my age, given everything that's gone on in my previous two and a half score plus. I'm into my, I'm ending my third score. Not for a while though. Okay. So what you do is you go to hotels, they bid, they want to host the teams, they want to host executives, they want to have rooms sold, especially in Miami in the summer when it's a downtime. So they were bidding against each other and we would choose hotels which had enough meeting spaces, which had where we could have security and all these different issues, but you do it very much in advance and then you sign a contract. The contract states that you are buying all of these rooms and then you resell them to the teams and to the players, to the players association, to executives, to sponsors, to guests. So you become basically the intermediary. But there's an out in every contract, which is a date after which the contract is firm and the money is owed to the hotel in full. It's like a cancellation policy that you'd have when you're going into a hotel or going on a trip. They always say, if you don't cancel within three days, we're charging you the full amount. Or they'll say, we're charging your credit card for one night. And if you don't come, we'll refund you up to 50%. If you cancel within two weeks, it's 20, 75% within three weeks or 0% if you cancel the day before, unless you have a note from your doctor that says you can't travel and then we'll still screw you. So in Indianapolis, word came out that all of the hotels got canceled. In the old days, no one would ever know that. You know how on Twitter you can now see when MLB games are being canceled because there's this Twitter site that actually follows, I think it's called Sports Teams Aviation or something, where if there's a flight that a team is taking, a team charter and it gets canceled, the team has not announced that a game's postponed or canceled. They haven't spoken about COVID, but this Twitter account announces, hey, there's no flight. And when there's no flight, guess what? That means the team isn't going. And then the team says, no, no, we're just going the next morning. We'll announce later. And then they announce, yeah, the game was postponed. So all of these aren't leaks. It's just, there's so many different ways to get information. This word came out because somebody who has a blog or, a, or someone in the media or someone who has some sort of voice or platform, has a connection of a general manager of a JW Marriott in Indianapolis. And by the way, they were on the phone talking about the normal drivel. Hey, did you know that the NBA canceled our contract? What a bunch of jerks. Ding, ding, breaking news. Well, the NBA hasn't commented, but I will. There is breaking news. The NBA All-Star Game will not be in Indianapolis in 2021 during President's Week. It's not going to happen. There is much discussion right now about the 2021 season. Will it be completely in a bubble the way their postseason has? Will it start December 1st or December 25th? Either way, that's not normally when a season would start, which would be around Halloween. So the All-Star break cannot be when it was going to be. It's a total cluster for Indianapolis. It's very unfortunate because losing all of those rooms, all of that economic impact, it has nothing to do with not as many people going to it because when you cancel, that means nobody's going to it. It for sure does not mean that the All-Star Game will now be at a safer location. There's no way to know what's safer in 2021. The NBA, when they're evaluating this, that's like the Major League Baseball saying, let's do a bubble in Florida because New York sucks. Now Florida sucks and New York's great. Now, now Florida's getting better. Maybe we can bubble there. How's Texas doing? They were good. Then they're bad. Then they're good. Then they're bad. MLB is looking at bubbles for postseason. I like Texas. I like California. Well, I like a peanut butter and jelly. It doesn't mean I have it every day. What you like today is not necessarily what you will like tomorrow. By the way, I don't know why I said jelly. I only like peanut butter and peanut butter. I actually make a sandwich with peanut butter on both pieces of bread and put them together. When I was younger, I liked jelly, but then it was too, um, and I would only use grape jelly, but it got too wet and I didn't like it. And do you know what actually was the turning point, if I could share this with you? when a company came out with peanut butter and jelly in the same jar. 
It was so disgusting to me that I couldn't do it. Coca just resigned, by the way. So we move on, although maybe we don't. It's business. It's nothing personal. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We're not done. <laughs> All right, so you want to talk to Samson. I appreciate your question. The All-Star Game, it's going to be announced. The NBA should have gotten ahead of it. They definitely should have, and they should have announced it, especially when it came out that the Indianapolis rooms got canceled. When we come back, we're going to review the number one trending movie on Netflix, which turns out doesn't mean much. And then we're going to get to talk about some fan capacity. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm actually saying that directly to Coco, though I have no idea whether he's back. If you're just joining us, Coco resigned earlier in the show because he didn't like that I was talking about jelly. So I watch a movie every day. You know that. One of the things I do is I look at Netflix. I look to see what's trending and I'll watch the top trending movies because I want to be hip. I want to be cool. Coco always says, be trendy. We've got to talk about trending topics. It turns out, I don't know what it takes to make something trend on Netflix. Maybe Netflix just decides to say something's trendy, even when it's not trendy, because they think by saying it's trendy, that'll make it trendy. That's like me thinking that if I talk about peanut butter and jelly, I'll make it cool and you'll be interested in it. Right, Coca? Well, I watched a new movie with Jamie Foxx. You know my personal foil. You've heard my Jamie Foxx story. So when he's in movies, you know I'm going to watch it. I also love Joseph Gordon-Levitt back from the little boy and river runs through it to Don John to 500 days of summer, which I want to review on this show. I love them. They're in a movie called project power. It also stars a woman I had never heard of named Dominique Fishback. So Dominique Fishback plays a young girl. Jamie Foxx plays either a bad guy or a good guy. We don't know. Joseph Gordon Levitt plays a police officer in new Orleans. There's no Bradley Cooper in this film, but there are pills that make people feel limitless. But instead of getting all of this brilliance, I think Scarlett Johansson was in a movie with Morgan Freeman where she was able to use more of her brain than anyone else. And I cannot remember what the name of the movie was, but I enjoyed it because who doesn't enjoy Scarlett Johansson kicking ass and taking prisoners? That may have been the beginning of her becoming a Marvel star and an action star. Same concept here. There is a pill that is invented that gives people superpowers. Here's the rub. You don't know whether or not the superpower you get is good or bad. You don't know whether you will die or not die. Lucy is the name. Thank you, Coca. He's back and better than ever. Now he's only a minute late with the information instead of on it. So you take the pill, you find out what your superpower is and you move on. The movie was bad, but I watched it all the way through because I was interested to see how it ended because the hook is what is Jamie Foxx's superpower? He has one pill that he doesn't want to take because he knows he can only take it once. Hint, hint. He knows that the power is so unbelievable that if he takes it more than once, that could be the end of him. Anyway, he takes the pill. Spoiler alert. There are shrimp involved. It's called Project Power. Okay. Nothing personal pick of the day. I'm six and seven. Garrett Cole beat the Red Sox. That was all the way back on Friday night. I had a nothing personal pick of the day last night, and we didn't get to it. So Coca, yet again, is not giving me credit. I'm going for 500 today, and I'm going against the grain. I actually think Texas may be an underdog against San Diego. They're going with Chris Paddock for the Padres. You know, the number one starter, who to me is number three or four. Against Mike Miner in the last year of a three-year, $28 million contract, who's put the M in mediocre. San Diego, clearly, after the game last night, is riled up. Texas, after the game last night, where they got their ass kicked, is riled up. I'm going Texas over San Diego. I think that they will be in position to win this game. And this is me saying I can get back to 500. And so I will. Okay, let's talk about fans. We're fans. What do we miss most? Sports are back. We're watching them on TV. 
sports on TV and HD. If you, if you come back and looked at an old game that's not in HD, I remember when we would have meetings. This is great. This is a true story. Each off season in the middle of our TV contract with our local rights holder, we would have a meeting with the head honchos where we would talk about what they're doing better to make our broadcast better. They'd ask us to do better and build a better team that would win more games so more people would watch. And we'd have some drinks and we'd look at some PowerPoint presentations. And then the end of the meeting would be this unveiling of this amazing give that our partners at Fox were making, now called Sinclair. David, we just want to let you know, you guys never finish above 500. You trade everyone away. Barely anyone watches. But this year, we're going to have 20 games in high definition. <laughs> By the way, that's real. That's 10 years ago. Now every game's in high definition. So you watch the games, you like how they look, you listen. I actually listen on mute at all times. I miss being at games. I've not been to a baseball game since the last game of the 2017 season. My last game as president of the Marlins. I've not been to one baseball game, professional baseball game. I've not been to one game of any sport. Once COVID started and we were all comfortable in our, on our couch, safe on our couch, the question was asked time and time again, will you go back to a game? Will you be a fan again who's willing to attend a game? People answered 60-40, no, 70-30, no. Then it was 60-40, yes, 70-30, yes. Then it was, I don't know. We'll see how I feel. We'll see whether it's safe. We'll see how politicized the virus gets. We'll see if there's a vaccine. We'll see who the anti-vaxxers are. Everyone's got a different reason. The reality is, as a team executive, we don't need, this was always a funny line that I would give to the uh, salespeople. So let's say there are 8 million people in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and Palm Beach. And we have a 40,000 seat stadium and we play 80 games so we can have at maximum 3.2 million people. I would always tell the salespeople, listen, when someone says they're not going to go to a game and you try to sell them and you realize that you're not getting anywhere, thank them. Say, thank you. We don't have room anyway. We can only have 3.2 million people come to our games. That means there's 5 million people who no matter how hard they try will not be able to attend a game. Don't laugh because only 5,000 people came to games. I was trying to explain to salespeople how to not waste time. It is very good to spend time to convert a maybe to a yes. It is very good to convert a no to a maybe. To convert a no to a yes is a two-step process that often the juice is not worth the squeeze. If you can get them to a maybe, you leave it alone and you touch them another time. If you can get the maybe to a yes, you've got the deal, you've got the commission. But if you know that you've got a no who's going to be a no, no matter what you do, they are a no, you thank them for their time and you make the next call. So Major League Baseball made a call yesterday. There had been rumors that teams were applying to have fans. Cincinnati was working out a deal with the local politicians, state politicians in Ohio. The Rockies wanted fans. Everyone wants fans because fans equals money. They equal money. Major League Baseball came out and said, at this time, as a league, we have decided that there will be no fans in the stands right now, period. It is a rule that we will have for all of baseball. We explained to you on Nothing Personal why that is with revenue sharing where teams and their local revenue get thrown into a pot and that pot then gets shared. There is a very difficult math equation that would occur if certain teams were allowed to have extra local revenue while other teams were not. You could have an example where a low revenue team like the Cincinnati Reds could be giving money to a high revenue team like the Los Angeles Dodgers because the Dodgers would have no fans and the Reds would. Having a uniform policy in that instance is critical. 
The NFL, on the other hand, has decided they want a different approach. Remember the NFL overall economic model is that an overwhelming majority of their revenue is split and it comes in the form of national broadcast revenue. Their national game, all their games are on national TV and that money is all split 32 ways. Of course, there are teams that differentiate themselves with gate revenue, but the Cowboys selling out AT&T Stadium versus a team like take the Miami Dolphins who don't charge as much, don't have as many fans. They're not as rabid fans. There is a big difference in that local revenue. And that is why the Cowboys are worth more as a team than the Dolphins. The ability to generate revenue locally in an industry where the majority of revenue is generated nationally. That is how you separate the men from the boys. It's the same concept as a matter of fact, in baseball, high revenue teams have bigger TV deals, they're in bigger markets versus low revenue teams are in smaller markets, therefore smaller TV deals. In addition, in smaller markets, you don't have the same price elasticity, which means you can't charge the same ticket prices. It's why New York can charge front uh, row prices that Miami never could or that the Brewers never can in Milwaukee. But in the NFL, the Chiefs came out in Kansas City and said, we plan on having 22% capacity next season. We plan on allowing up to 15,000 fans. The Bears came out the same day and said, we've decided no fans. The Cowboys want fans from the beginning. Another team came out, the, Ray Oakley, the, the, um, the, La the Las Vegas Raiders, no fans. There's another team that came out and said, we're going to have no fans for the first two games and then reevaluate. It is zero uniformity. And the problem with no uniformity is that you are putting owners in a position where to keep up with the Joneses, they're going to make decisions and pressure local politicians that they will be left so far behind that their football team will be at a competitive disadvantage. And then that will impact, believe it or not, their ability to get reelected. You think we're crazy? You think politicians don't enjoy when sports teams win and they get to be at the forefront of that? They do. You can ride sports victories to political wins. Believe it or not, it's been done. I've seen it actually. You can also ride sports losses to political losses, or you can be a politician who supports something that helps the sports team and then you get recalled. Everything's possible. But the NFL's job has got to be to make it uniform. They have got to, and here's why. In addition to owners working against each other and pressuring for the possibility where health and safety protocols will be at risk, what you are saying as Roger Goodell is that you are fine with the different franchisees of your brand having different opinions about something where the country is so divided right now. And from a business standpoint, that's a mistake. What sports leagues need to be doing is promoting unity. They need to be promoting the possibility that as an organization, they can come together no matter how disparate their political views are, no matter how disparate their market size is, and they can come together and make decisions as a group. And that's got ramifications and ripple effects for our entire society. In a world right now, it's primary day right here in Miami today, in South Florida. In a world where divisiveness is absolutely the word of the day, much more so than unwritten. The NFL had a moment, but why are we surprised? The NFL, this entire COVID pandemic, has been doing nothing but making sure that their season progresses exactly in the way it needs to, to maximize the revenue to the owners and maintain those asset values that are seen in Forbes. The NFL, by not having a uniform attendance rule, is giving you the best example possible on a random Tuesday that it's always business. It's nothing personal.